And we're in a very long passage this morning. So if you're new this morning, what we do here at Loft City is we go through books of the Bible and we just study what God is teaching. And um, we are right now in the Gospel of John and we're looking specifically, what does John teach us about Jesus? And so this morning we're going to be actually looking at about 40 verses and I'm going to try to consolidate it into about 30, 35 minutes. And so you need to pray for me um, as we dive into this morning into our text. So John... 6, and we're going to be from verses 22 all the way to 59. John 6, 22 to 59. And so if you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, you know that there's this tension in our salvation. There's this tension that we face, how salvation is absolutely free, and yet the reality is it costs you everything. There's not a thing that you can hold on to, how it's easy as childlike faith, and yet it's probably the hardest decision you'll ever make in your life, how... Um, It's the source of the greatest amount of joy that in fact that you are being made right with God. And yet it's also the source of so much struggle and trial as you follow Jesus. How he who would save his life must lose it. And how he would lose his life will save it. C.S. Lewis would say it this way. He would say, the Christian way is different. Christ says, give me all. And I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but come to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and cut off a branch there. I want to have the whole tree cut down. I want to hand over the whole natural self, all the desires that you think innocent, as well as the ones that you think wicked, the whole outfit, and I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I'll give you myself. In our text this morning, Jesus is going to say some very hard, difficult things. As a matter of fact, many of the things that he will say will bring confusion to the people that are listening and will cause confusion for us. He's going to give contrast in our passage between the unbelief and the sin of the crowd and the reality and the claims of himself. It's like a boxing match that's going on between Jesus and the people where we have sin and great sin on one side and grace on the other, religion versus gospel, the crowd versus Jesus. And the reality is all of us in this room will find ourselves in one of two corners this morning. You're either under sin or you're under grace. You're either into religion or you're into the gospel. You're either following the crowd or you're following Jesus, and while Jesus will talk about the crowd and how sin and religion leads to death four times in our 40 verses, he's going to talk about himself and grace that leads to life over 20 times in these verses. In, in short, what he's going to do is he's going to offer us himself. And the question is, what are we going to do with the claims of Jesus this morning? What do we do with it? So here's our outline this morning. We're going to tackle this passage by using three comparisons of sin versus great and grace, and we're going to see um, different things about sin versus grace. And my prayer for you is that you will see the value, the supremacy of the grace of Jesus over the fleeting pleasures of sin, that you would see that Jesus is so much more worth following than following sin and pursuing the things of this world, that you would put these truths into your arsenal, that when the enemy tempts you, you'll pull it out and be reminded of the grace of Jesus in your life. My prayer for some of you this morning is that you would come all the way in following Jesus. That this wouldn't be a, hey, I'm on the fence, that I'm, sometimes I'm in and sometimes I'm out, um, that you would be fully committed to following Jesus. So three things I want you to notice. Number one, sin is exhausting, but grace is easy. Sin is exhausting, but grace is easy. Verse 22, John 6, 22. The next day the crowd remained on the other side of the sea and saw that there, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that the disciples had gone away alone. So again, this morning we find ourselves at the Sea of Galilee. And apparently the crowd that Jesus had dismissed the night before, have come back. They wanted to find Jesus. But this time, those who were miraculously fed with the five loaves and two fishes returned now, and they had their campaign managers, and they had all these people. They had these buttons saying, vote for King Jesus. They wanted to make Israel great again, and all this stuff going on. And what they noticed was there's only one boat present 
All the other boats were gone, and they knew that the disciples had already been sent off because they saw Jesus pushing them away. So they were looking for Jesus, trying to find him. They were, thought Jesus was around. Verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Now there's a bunch of boats coming to the shores where the disciples had launched off, and no doubt they had taken shelter from the storm the night before, but apparently these guys were looking for Jesus. You can imagine the word spreading around town. 15,000 people were miraculously fed with five loaves, two fishes, and people were walking home telling everyone what Jesus had done for them, how he fed them. Verse 24. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got themselves into the boat and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So now the crowds are on this frantic search and rescue mission for presidential candidate Jesus, right? They want to find him. The word seek there is the idea of hunting. They are dra- searching and hunting for Jesus. They conclude that he must have gotten over the Sea of Galilee to the other side. That so they commandeer their vessels and they hurry and they look for themselves and they wear themselves out looking for Jesus. Now that may sound good to us. Man, these people are really trying to find Jesus, but... These guys weren't interested in Jesus. They were only interested in what Jesus could do for them. They were, in essence, looking for a different Jesus than the Jesus we find in the Bible. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? The text indicates that they found him after this exhausting search. Maybe they were texting guys on the other boats like, did you see him? Did you see him? And they pin Jesus on their Google Maps and they find him and they surround him. And you can imagine them asking Jesus, where have you been? We've been looking all night for you. Why are you playing hard to get? How did you get across the sea anyway? We've got our campaign manager with us. We've created a super pack. We're ready to get this thing rolling. You just need to say yes. Oh, by the way, um, we're tired and hungry. Can you make some more food show up out of nowhere, right? And so these guys are just interested in what Jesus could do for them. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus nails them. He exposes their motivations. He says, you aren't seeking me. You're only seeking what I can do for you. Just like the disciples, they missed the point of the miracle that he had done and only saw an opportunity to exploit Jesus for their own advancement. By the way, if you're not aware, that sort of stuff happens all the time, especially in American politics. We use Jesus just to make ourselves look good. And you know what Jesus' assessment of all their effort was? He says, you know what you're doing? It's exhausting. It's draining. The pursuit of this world and all of its empty promises, the pursuit of religion and seeing God as some kind of divine powerball game where you work for him hoping to hit it big, Jesus says it's exhausting. This is why he says in verse 27, he says, Don't labor for food that perishes. He exhorts them, literally, don't work yourself to the point of exhaustion. The word there is where we get the word agonize. He's saying, do not exhaust yourselves with the world and religion because all those things will only perish. In those days, there was no refrigeration. That means whatever you caught today, you ate today because by tomorrow, it will spoil. And Jesus says, your pursuit of this world, your labor in religion while yielding some pleasure for today, it's not going to satisfy you tomorrow. This is why the pursuit never stops, because you have to go out tomorrow and you've got to catch more fish. You've got to labor again. You've got to repeat it the next day and the next day. And it's exhausting. It's tiring. And if you're into religion, you never know when you've done enough for God to accept you. You never know when you've done enough to say you've been made right with God. You never know when you've done enough to say God will accept you and approve of you. You never know if you've done enough that when you face death, you're going to see death as an enemy or a friend. You never know if you're trying to gain God's approval. See, whatever you pursue as a substitute for Jesus, whatever you lean on that is not Jesus, whether you think it is good or bad, it's sin, it's idolatry, and it will exhaust you, 
and it will drain your soul. No person, not your husband, your wife, your children, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your professors, whatnot, no person, no place, no thing, not your money, not your car, not your home, not the things that you own, no person, place, or thing was ever meant to carry the weight of your eternal soul. Only Jesus could do that. Sin is always foolish, and it will make you look stupid, and it will always drain the soul, the life out of your soul. And yet, while sin is exhausting, I want you to notice how sweet grace is. I want you to notice how easy grace is. Verse 27, do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Notice, Jesus will give this to you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you what endures to eternal life. What you really need cannot be earned by you. And there's that tension again. But listen, guys, friends, Jesus is the real deal. When he says the Father set the seal on him, think about it this way. Jesus, basically, God stamps a seal on him, says satisfaction guaranteed. You are not going to be disappointed. But the reality is, you and I, we ignore the label. We are hardwired to think that we have to earn favor with God. So is the crowd, verse 28. He said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? It was like Jesus' offer goes in one year and out the other. They're so caught up in their religious system of obey and then God will love you. Do good works and then God will accept you. Work and then God will receive you. That they feel that they have to prove their worth to God. To say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to give more? Sure, I'll do that. Do you want me to serve more? I'll do that. Do you want me to volunteer in kids' church? Do you want me to go to church more? Just tell me what I need to do and I will put my best foot forward. Listen, I don't know where you are today and where your heart is, but if your identity is not found in the grace of Jesus, if your identity is not found in the gospel, can I tell you, you are exhausting yourself. You are wearing yourself out. Everyone in this room has an answer to verse 28. Islam says you keep the five pillars. Judaism says you keep the law of Moses. Roman Catholicism says you keep the sacraments. Hinduism says you perform religious rituals to reach nirvana. Buddhism says you follow the eightfold path. Mormonism says you get baptized and you keep the commandments. Jehovah Witnesses says you be faithful to the Watchtower Society and you pray that you're good enough to be part of the 144,000. Evangelical Christians say you have to vote for a certain party. It's everyone has an idea of what we must do to be accepted. But look at Jesus' answer in verse 28. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe him whom he sent. Jesus says, you want eternal life? It's true. It must be worked for. It must be earned. But the work isn't done by you. It's done by Jesus himself. He changes it from the works of God to the work of God. It only requires that you place your faith and your trust in him whom the Father has sent, turning the keys over, laying your life down at the feet of Jesus. You got to ask, where does this mindset come in us? Where does this mindset come in them and us that we think that we have to earn God's favor? Why do we think that we have to work for God's approval? Like every sin out there, it's a good thing that's been twisted and contorted by the enemy. See, God created you and I to work. We're created to do stuff. It is in our DNA. It is part of our imprint of the image of God in us. But sin has twisted the design so that somehow we think we have to earn God's favor, that we have to work for it. We've applied a work ethic that God has designed in us to things of this world, and we've applied it to Jesus and salvation and a relationship with God, which it was never meant to be applied to. The truth is, you and I, we've been duped by sin, thinking that we are better than we really are, that we're more capable than we really are. This is why we've said it before, that not only do we have to repent of the sins we've done, but we also have to repent of our righteousness, thinking that we bring anything good to the table, that unless we repent both of our sins and our self-righteousness, we will never be saved. 
Like, until you understand that there's not a single good thing you bring, you don't understand the gospel. You have to see yourself as bankrupt, broken, poor, hopeless, without an ounce of righteousness, nothing to offer to God before you can actually see the value, the worth, the beauty, the salvation that Jesus offers you. The whole point of Jesus' lesson in this passage is to bring people to the end of themselves so that they could see how beautiful and marvelous he is. Isaiah 64, we all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. You say, why did God set things up that way? Why can't we just earn God's favor? Really, one simple reason. So that he and he alone would get the glory. Because the giver always gets the glory. You know, Christmas time or your birthday, when you get a gift... I hope you don't go and say, finally, thank you, I finally got what I deserve, you finally give it to me, right? You don't say that. You say, thank you. And who gets the glory? It's the person that gave the gift. Salvation is all of grace. It's a sheer gift, and you can't take any credit for it. But most of us are unwilling to come down to the place of a beggar and receive everything for nothing. Isaiah 48, for my own sake, for my own sake I do it. How can my name be profound? My glory I will give to, to, I will not give to another. You say, so the gospel is laying it all down at Jesus' feet, and once you're saved, then you pick it back up and get to work and keep that salvation? I encourage you that even the baby steps that you take in your effort to follow Jesus, even the good deeds that you do is a is a work of God's grace in your life. He will always get the glory. Let me give you some verses. First Peter, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus, to him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 2, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Philippians 2, therefore, my beloved, just as you've always behaved, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 2 Peter 3, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. My friends, when we get to the judgment seat of God in Revelation, we find that unbelievers, they have this book open and they're judged based on all of their works. But if you are a follower of Jesus, there's another book for you and there's nothing in there but your name. There's not about all the good things you've done. There's not anything in there about all the wrong things you've done all there is is your name this is why when you read of people in heaven in revelation they cast their crowns at the feet of jesus this is why they sing so enthusiastically this is why there's joy oozing from their fingertips because for the first time reality sinks in that all of this is because of his grace and his mercy. We have no business in heaven apart from grace, no credit that we can take. You won't be in heaven comparing resumes to other people. You'll only be enraptured, awestruck, captivated by the resume of our Savior and what he has done for you and what he has done for me. It is his grace and his grace alone. So what does that mean for your life now in following Jesus? It means that grace means everything. Think about why you sin. If you don't forgive someone, it's not simply because there's a lack of obedience in your life, but it's a failure to believe that you've been saved by grace and been forgiven by God, and you don't extend that to other people. That's why you don't forgive people, because you don't understand grace. If you lie to cover something up, it's not simply a lack of obedience, but it's a failure to find your acceptance in God rather than the approval of other people. 
This is why we don't confess sin to one another. Because this is why we're not quick to repent to one another. Because if we're depending on our works to make us acceptable to God, then we won't confess sin, but we'll cover it up because it's our only hope in moral achievement and how good we look, being better than the person next to us. But listen, when we're centered on grace, when we're centered on the gospel, it's easy for us to confess. It's easy for us to repent more often because we know that Jesus will never cast us away. We've been accepted. We've been loved. That's why we can forgive because we know how much he has forgiven us. That's why we can serve because we know how much he served so that we can be a part of the family of God. God loved us not based on our performance, but on the performance of Jesus. This is why we must always go back to grace. This is why we can never graduate from the gospel. This is why the gospel has to be a the A to Z of our lives. We have to go back to it. Second Peter 2 says, all of our character flaws in our lives, all the sins in our lives, are the result of the fact that we have forgotten that we are cleansed from our sins. The reason you sin is because very often you forget what Jesus has done for you. Tim Keller would say it this way, the key to continual and deeper spiritual renewal and revival is the continual rediscovery of the gospel. Can I encourage you this morning? Is this just a simple Sunday school lesson that you know that Jesus died for you, or do you still get captured by the fact that his grace has saved you, has redeemed you, has made you a part of his family, that there's not a single thing that you can do to receive God's grace? You would never earn it on your own, but he freely gives it to you because of Jesus. Does that still capture your heart? Do you get overwhelmed by the fact that he loves you? That you would be lost apart from him? And yet in his grace and his mercy, he saved you, he redeemed you, he called you a part of his family. Sin is exhausting. Grace is easy. Number two, sin is blinding. Grace is beckoning. Grace is welcoming. Sin is blinding. Grace is welcoming. Verse 30. And they said to them, they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? So here's the crowd. They're like, hey, Jesus, perform a trick for us. Put on a show for us. Make us laugh, Jesus. You're the circus clown. Make us entertain, Jesus. Sin is so blinding to them. That even though Jesus just did a miracle for this exact same crowd the night before, when they fed them with five loaves and two fishes, they don't even remember that. And the language indicates that they don't even think that Jesus can do a sign that we might possibly see and believe. How could they ask such a question? By this time already, we've seen Jesus turn water into wine. We've seen him take a temple court that's the size of 14 football fields and clear it out. We've seen him heal dozens and dozens of people that were sick, cast out demons, give people sight, give people the ability to walk. He's calmed two storms. He's fed 15,000 people with bread and fish. And yet they still don't believe. And you say, man, if I was there, if I had seen Jesus, then I would surely believe. All, if I had seen Jesus do this, I'd believe. Really? Do you think that all you need is some miracles, some proof? You have all the proof that you need in the gospel, and yet we often are people of unbelief. Jesus tells a story of a poor man by the name of Lazarus who would beg outside of a rich man's home, and they both die, and the rich man ends up in hell, and Lazarus ends up in heaven. And the, and the rich man talks to Father Abraham, who's next to Lazarus, and says, if you would, in Luke 16, he says, if you would just send someone back from the dead to the people, my brothers and my family, they'd repent. And Abraham says to him, he says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Listen, sin has so blinded us that we wouldn't believe, even if a person was raised from the dead in front of us and told us about Jesus. So here's Jesus standing before them, and they feel like now Jesus needs some kind of education on what a real miracle looks like. And so they bring up their great, 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 great grandpa Moses and says, you know, Moses, he was a real miracle worker. He can do stuff. Verse 31, he says, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. 
verse 31, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Pause with me. Think about this. Think about the miracle that they chose to bring up to Jesus. They could have easily chosen something like the Red Sea parting. They could have talked about the fire coming down that Elijah did. They could have talked about how the, the lions were silent in front of Daniel. But they chose the miracle of God giving bread in the wilderness and feeding a multitude. Sound familiar? They were so blinded by their sin and unbelief that they don't even see the comparison to what they just experienced the day before. Jesus, verse 32, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's not Moses that gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. And here's Jesus tearing down the idol of Moses. He says, it wasn't Moses that gave you bread. Moses didn't perform any miracles for you. God did. It was God who did it. Moses just told him it would happen. And this is why Jesus is the true and better Moses. He didn't just tell them about the miracle of the bread and that the bread would appear. He caused it to appear. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, give us this bread always. They still don't get it. They're still thinking of what Jesus can do for them, and they don't want Jesus for themselves. They're thinking of unlimited bread like um, salads and soup at Olive Garden, right? Um, They're just thinking about what they could be satisfied with. Sin has blinded them. They're elbowing their friends. They're saying, watch out. He's about to drop bread down from heaven. Watch this. It's going to be fun. And throughout the gospel of John, we see that people are blinded by their sin. Nicodemus was blinded. The woman at the well was blinded. The disciples were blinded. The crowds were blinded. The religious leaders were blinded. No one saw Jesus for who he was. They thought life came from something that you can do and not for someone who's already done everything for you. They want to know this bread, so Jesus tells them about it. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. And Jesus uses that word again, ego ami, I am. We talked about it this last week. This is the same word that's used in Exodus when God says, I am that I am. Jesus says, I am. And he uses this phrase about eight times in the Gospel of John. The result is that those who do believe and follow him will not hunger and thirst again. Well, you say, why bread? Because it was satisfying. It subsidized the hunger pains. But it was also necessary for life during that time. This is why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus would teach us, give us this day our daily bread. Just as they couldn't go long without bread, they couldn't survive the penalty and the attack of sin without Jesus. Verse 36, but I say to you, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. And here's Jesus summarizing the effects of sin. He says it's blinding. Salvation is standing right before your eyes. God is standing right in front of you and yet you do not believe, you do not see, you're blind. How can God stand in front of you and not, you not see him? Because you're like a woman that's enamored with her new shoes or like a guy that's talking about how great your football team is or a teenager that's texting on the phone and posting on Instagram all the while you're standing on the precipice of the Grand Canyon because you, but you miss it because you're so caught up on something else. You can't, you don't want to look up. You don't, you've been, sin has captured you with its deceit. It has pulled a wool over your eyes. You don't see the value, the worth, the supremacy, the beauty of Jesus. And you know what? Here's the reality. We are content with our blindness. We're okay with being blind. We don't want to see. We don't want to come to the bread of life and eat. And you know this from animals, right? Um, Lions are not going to eat a bale of hail that you put in front of them. They might eat you, but they're not going to eat the hail. They're not going to eat the hay. Why? Can they not digest the hay? Absolutely. But they don't want it. They would rather die before eating hay. I don't know if any of you are vegetarians in this room, but you put a 12 
ounce filet mignon oozing with butter in front of you, and you will not touch it. You would rather eat the utensils and the plate before you eat the meat. If you're a Christian today, if you're a follower of Jesus today, it is a miracle of God because you were blinded and dead by your sin. You're not a Christian because you are somehow smarter than the non-Christians in this room. It's not because you are somehow better than them. It's not because you were born with a Christian heritage. It's not because you went to a Christian school and they didn't. It is only because God has removed the blinders from your eye and caught you and captured you by his grace. There is not a thing that you can boast about. It is purely the grace of Jesus. And that puts us in an impossible situation, but I want you to know that sin is blinding, but grace is beckoning, it's welcoming. Notice the phrase come in verses 35 and 37. There's an invitation there. It's welcoming. You must believe. But Jesus said that those who are blind, it says twice that the Father draws them in. It's like the call goes out for all to believe and follow Jesus, but no one will come. No one sees the value of Jesus. All are blinded. All have gone their own way, like Romans 3 says. You say, wait a minute, how is one saved then? Answer, whoever believes in Jesus will never thirst, and whoever comes to Jesus will never be cast out. But Jesus says the Father must draw them in. So which is it? Is it their faith, or is it the Father drawing them? The answer is yes. It's both. Faith alone in Jesus is required to be made right with God, and yet it's only those who the Father draws in that will have faith. It's like we die and we're standing in front of the pearly gates of heaven and there's a sign that says that whoever may come. And yet as you enter, you look back on the door, you see another sign that says chosen before the foundation of the world. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Now this is going to be a little bit of a hard theology for some of you guys that grew up in churches that might have taught you that your salvation, you can lose it and you might be able to keep it a day and lose it the next day and gain it back the next day and you go back and forth. But Jesus says that if we've been drawn, he will never cast us out. The language indicates that Jesus takes this personally. I myself will never cast you out. This is the preservation of the saints. Some of you heard this phrase, perseverance of the saints. I I prefer the word preservation. You can never lose your salvation. The word lose is used in lose. The word lose is used in Luke 6 to taking a speck out of someone's eyes. Jesus says that you can never irritate him and he will never want to throw you away. I know you may feel like there's some days where you feel like Jesus wants to throw you away because you can never get things right. But until you understand that truth, you cannot move away from that feeling. You will never move away from that feeling to be overcome by grace and empowered to stand strong. Why don't, we, why don't we irritate him? Why don't we annoy him? Why doesn't he want to cast us out? Because he sees Jesus' life, not ours. We've been imputed the grace of Jesus. But you say, I thought I could just deny Jesus and walk away. If it was up to you, then you could, but you are saved by grace and you are kept by grace. The Father gives you to the Son and the Son keeps you. The only way you can lose your salvation is if God decided to let you go, but the Word promises that He will never let you go. Listen, there is nothing new that you can show Him in sinning that He hasn't seen before He drew you in. And he saved you by faith anyway. He knows your tomorrow, and yet he still saved you. Do you really think you can shock God by your sin? The thought that a follower of Jesus can somehow lose their salvation is debilitating. It weakens you. It cripples you. Because you're constantly wondering, God, am I good enough? Am I worthy enough? John 10, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them from my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Romans 8, we heard this earlier, I'm sure that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, that should fire you up. That should get you motivated. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing can separate you from Jesus. Not sin, not suffering, not supernatural powers. There is nothing in this world that can separate you from Jesus. That should cause you to do some crazy things for Jesus because he's got your back. He loves you. He serves you. That should cause you to be in community where you can be open and transparent. That should cause you to be on mission for Jesus. That should cause you to give to Jesus. That should cause you to take risks for Jesus because he loves you and got your back. That should give you courage because I'm invincible. The only thing that man can do to me is send me straight to Jesus. Sin is exhausting. Grace is easy. Sin is blinding. Grace is welcoming. Finally, sin is fatal. But grace is forever. Verse 41. We read this during scripture reading this morning. So the Jews grumbled about him, saying, because he said, I'm the bread that came from heaven. This crowd is not happy now. They came earlier in the morning. They wanted to make Jesus president. Now they're not happy. They wanted Jesus to be their political hero and give, him, uh, give a campaign speech, but instead he's claiming to be divine and talking about life and death. There's no way he came from heaven because they know who his father is, right? Verse 42, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I came down from heaven? How can he make this claim? This doesn't settle well with them. Why? The reason is because grace is offensive. Grace is offensive. It's like the Tower of Babel. They had spent their whole life building this tower all the way to heaven, but Jesus comes down and he topples it all over. They're offended at the thought that heaven would need to come down to them. They didn't want heaven to come down to them. They needed to figure out how to get to heaven. They didn't want divine assistance. They didn't want Jesus to come down. They just wanted to earn their way to Jesus. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Listen, these guys are not swimming in the ocean and needing someone to rescue them and throw them a lifeboat. They're at the bottom of the ocean in need of a rescue and recitation. They're walking spiritual zombies who are going the opposite way and need to be drawn by the Father. He literally says no one has the power. No one is able. The word... Does that mean my time's up? Uh, The word draw there literally means to drag. It's used in Acts 16 for Paul and Silas being dragged into the market and stoned. And in John 21, referring to John 21, where it talks about dragging and hauling the heavy load of fish. God will bring his people kicking and screaming if necessary. But if God has you in his crosshairs, he is going to bring you down and he's going to bring you to himself. The image of a shepherd carrying a lost sheep over his shoulder is a lie. Sheep bite, they scratch, they kick, they run. They're not just going to be content on the shepherd's um, shoulders. Many times a shepherd will have to break the leg of the sheep to bring him back home. Verse 49, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Everyone who's eaten of this world, everyone who finds their identity and treasure in the things of this world, it would kill you. You found they taste good, but it only brings you death. Jesus says, if you come to me, I alone will nullify the sting of death. It will go from being a dreaded enemy to becoming a welcoming friend because for you who are a follower of Jesus, that just means you now get to spend eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's no longer a threat to you. Why? Because Jesus would go down into death and bust a hole in the back of it and bid us to come through and say, you're okay. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the third time that Jesus makes this statement. He keeps telling them the same thing over and over, and they still don't get it. And this time, he's going to tell them how he's going to die for them. And notice, he's going to die voluntarily. I will give. I'll give my life. He's going to lay it down, and no one is going to take it from him. This is a vicarious death for the life of the world. This means his death would be in our place. It would be our cross. And finally, it would be a violent death. My flesh, my blood. It's a reference not just to his death, but his violent sacrificial death. These are all foretold by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 52 and 53. Look at verse 52. The Jews disputed among themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? The word disputed there is, for, is used for physical hand-to-hand combat. So this wasn't a couple of guys drinking a cup of tea, talking about what Jesus said. These guys were livid. They're angry. They literally said, how does he have the power to give us his flesh to eat? So the question is not how dare he suggest we eat his body, but rather how is it even possible to even give your flesh for someone to eat while you're alive? You have to die to give your flesh. They're still not getting what Jesus is saying. And what Jesus is saying is he has to die in order for for him to give life. He must die in order for us to give, get credit for his life. He dies, we live. If he lives, we die. But these guys didn't want him to die. They wanted him to be the political savior. They wanted him to be king. They wanted him to reign. They wanted him to rescue them from Rome. Listen, a dead Jesus is no value in their minds, but it's infinitely valuable for those who get the gospel. Jesus can only give his flesh If he dies, and that's exactly what he's going to do. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Jesus says, you have to eat my flesh. You have to drink my blood. And that just causes them to blow a mental gasket because because one of the sins in the Old Testament was to drink blood. But notice Jesus says, if you don't have this, you you won't have life in you. Blood in the Old Testament, blood for us represents life. You see what Jesus is saying? That unless I give my life for you, unless I give my blood for you, you won't have any life in you. As a matter of fact, you don't have any life in you now. So why tell them to eat? Why tell them to drink? That sounds nasty. The word eat and drink there is very much synonyms for the same things that he's been saying all throughout the gospel. Things like believe, come, look, listen, learn. Now it's eat and drink because these are perfect illustrations of what it means to believe in Jesus. You got to take him in. You got to assimilate him into your life. And he doesn't just go into one part of your life, but he wants to fill every single part of it. Salvation is all of you for all of him and all of him for all of you. As C.S. Lewis said, Jesus doesn't just want so much of your time and so much of your energy and so much of your money and so much of your work. He wants all of you. He wants all of you. And when you give him all of you, what he does is he gives you all of him. Verse 58. Whoever feeds on this bread will drink, will live forever. Jesus says that sin is fatal. But grace is forever. You either feed on Jesus, believing in his death for you and following him, or you feed on the ashes of this world. Don't be fooled into thinking that Jesus is some kind of option for you, kind of like a buffet line or an appetizer or a dessert. Jesus is the whole meal. He's everything. And when you get the gospel, when the penny finally drops for you and you experience the drawing and the affection of God, you finally give in. Some of you this morning, you need to stop fighting God this morning and you need to surrender. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you need to respond to Jesus. If you've been feasting on this world, you need to take time to repent and turn to Jesus Listen, he will not cast you out. Be honest. Stop hiding. Come worship Jesus this morning in taking of the bread and the juice as tangible reminders that he, of what he has done for you. For others of you, you need to come this morning all the way to Jesus. 
You've been fighting him. You've been putting up your defenses, and you just need to lay it all down this morning. Stop thinking you're okay because you've grown up here, or because you made some profession of faith because you were, when you were a child. You know in your heart that you don't follow Jesus, even though you come to church week in and week out, even though you do all this stuff, and you might have been coming in church your entire life. If today you hear his voice, please don't harden your hearts. Surrender. Come all the way to Jesus. Come to him.